I wanted to ask you now, because this is the hot topic, especially in the Muslim community, about your conversion. Yeah. So tell us the story, like what happened exactly? Well, I think a lot of people who've been following me for a while understand that I've been mm. very respectful of Islam for a long time. Yeah, sure. I was born in a Christian country. I was raised as a Christian. And I've always been very respectful of Islam. And it's become more and more obvious to me and, and more and more pertinent that Islam is the last religion mm. on the planet. Mm. When I talk about Islam, because I'm new to it, yeah. I, I, I'm a little bit careful, right? Because I'm new to it. I'm certainly not a scholar. There's so much I need to learn. I know I'm on a learning journey. I'm not here to sit here and, and talk scripture. I, I don't know those things yet. I'm here to learn. Yeah. But, and we're here at your assistance. Anyway, thank you, bro. Thank honestly. you. Thank you. Yeah. But um, it's just for me, it feels like the last religion on earth. I feel like there's no other religion. People say to me, why did you convert? And I said, I don't really think, feel it as a conversion. I, it's almost like I knew God was real and now I've become religious. And they say, well, you were religious before. I was like, religious before how? Christian? Mm. What does Christian mean? Mm. Like, who's not a Christian? You go to Christian nations and everyone says they're a Christian. Look how they live their lives. Go yeah. into the average church. Is anyone actually fearful of God? Yeah. Anybody? Mm -hmm. No. The girls are out on Saturday night drinking and mm. they turn up to church because their parents made them. Mm -hmm. Like, there's, there's no substance to the religion. And also... Islam very closely reflects my personal beliefs. I, through my personal life, I've yeah. learned that if you don't have standards and you're not a strong person who's prepared to defend his ideas, you'll be crushed. Yes. And we look at most religions in the world today which are not prepared to defend their ideas. What's happened to them? They're just getting crushed. And yeah. now we have Christianity as an idea which has basically said, well, we can't set any firm rules because everyone will just quit. So instead, let's make it so easy to be a Christian that nobody has to put any effort in yeah. and then accept everybody no matter what. And hopefully we can keep the church doors open. <laughs> that's not that's not yeah, God yeah. to me. You know, yeah, yeah. God to me is is strong. God to me is something to be feared. Yeah. God to me is something someone that people are afraid to mock. Yeah. God to me is someone that you have to go out of your way to prove something to. God yeah. to me has red lines yeah. like God to me re represents the Islamic faith. The Christian God to me, I don't see God. I, I can't explain. I don't see anything there. So, yeah. to me, it was it was the only logical choice wow. in the end. Alhamdulillah, man. I mean, many as you're saying this, I'm sure many people are like ecstatic and extremely happy. It's a great, it's a great thing for everyone, honestly, because, you know, just anyone coming into Islam is, is you know, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us better than the world and everything in it. Yeah. But imagine now somebody of major influence. I mean, you're the most Googled person on the planet. I'm not yeah. sure if you still have yeah. I'm, spot I, th I think Putin might have beat me as of last week. But I think it's between me and Putin at the moment. Uh, <laughs> but I don't want to lose to Putin. Look, Putin's the big G. I don't want more enemies. Like it's, it's fine, Vladimir. You can have it. <laughs> I never thought I'd hear you saying that statement. Yeah. Putin beat me last year. Right? Yeah, <laughs> last yeah. Week. I think we're just certainly the most Google. <laughs> but no, no, it's, it's, it's definitely something beautiful. And uh, a lot of people have... Uh, you know, you'll be they genuinely have a problem with baseline morality. Yes. Yeah. Understand. When... Uh, some people recognize when I converted to Islam that mm. there was a time I was an atheist. There was a time when I was atheistic. Mm. And the reason I am now so absolutely certain that God is real is because yeah. I've seen evil. I've seen shaitan. Yeah. I've seen it. When you see enough evil, you realize that there must be an equal and opposite force. And there right. are people out there in the world today doing the work of the devil, genuine demons, who are trying to destroy the baseline morality that's inside of all of us. We're all born with some kind of morality, and they're trying to destroy it. And that's exactly the Islamic understanding, that, that we believe that you're born with something called fitrah, which is the initial goodness. You're, you're, you're born with an innate belief, receptivity to believe in one God. Yeah. And then that is corrupted. In fact, there's a prophet, uh, hadith of the prophet, where he says, كُلُّ مَوْلُودٍ يُولَدُ عَلَى الْفِطْرَةِ Every born child is born upon this initial goodness. فَأَبَوَاهُ يُهَوِّدَانِهِ أَوْ يُنَصْرَانِهِ أَوْ يُمَجِّسَانِهِ And then his f father and mother or his parents, they socialize him into you know, Christianity, Judaism, yeah. ma Magiism. So th the idea is that everyone is born with this initial... Uh, goodness and this initial uh, will or want to believe in God, one yeah. God, and then as you mentioned, I mean, it's, it's what you're mentioning here is really is profound because you're you're, you're mentioning a, a central doctrine in Islam. But but it's and 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 this is why perhaps I f I found God the way I did because mm. I understood all these things mm. first and then I saw the Quran and it confirmed so many things for me. You know, mm. like I've the, even the conversations I've been having so far, so many things have been confirmed and it's amazing the knowledge that's inside of it, which is so applicable today. Yeah. yeah. For 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 an old book, right? You know, it's supposed to be old, but it seems yeah. so so timeless. But it's truly amazing. But you're you're totally right. And and the baseline morality, I don't think most people understand that when they're doing this under the guise of tolerance, when they're saying be so tolerant that you no longer believe in right from wrong, 
They're not doing that to make society a better place. They're doing that to empty your brain so that you have no resistance to the slave mind programming. They want to yeah. get you to a point where if they tell you the sky is green, yeah. you look at it with your own eyes yeah, and yeah. you see blue, but no, the sky is green. That's what they want. So that you have to have nothing in your brain that can prevent that. If you have God, if you have no, I believe this is right point. and wrong. Yeah. If yeah. you have personal responsibility, if you have self-accountability, mm -hmm. if you're a person who sticks up for what he believes, all that's bad to them. They want all of that gone yeah. so they can tell you the sky is green. Mm -hmm. And and I don't want to say too much because I don't want the stream to end, but they're going to tell you something much worse than the sky is green. They're going to tell you something else. And and it's, they're trying to program us all into slaves. And it's I, scary. I remember when I was in my undergraduate days and I was uh, reading a particular book by this guy called Jeremy Bentham who became like, you know, the spiritual forefather of J.S. Mill, who is the father of like social liberalism of today. And I remember reading this because it was so powerful because it linked to something I read in the Quran. He said that, you know, you have two gods. He said, you have the God of pain and you have the God of pleasure. And I thought, this is so interesting. The Quran states, you know, have you seen the one who takes his own desires as a God? Yep. And because now there is no transcendental force that we can look up and, and as you say venerate now we're forced to be slaves to the system yeah we're to our own desires or i mean the quran has another verse which i think is so powerful and it connects very well with what you're saying it says god darab allahu mathalan rajulan that god has struck a parable of a man fihi shuraka mutashakisuna that he's got many different slave owners wa rajul salaman li rajulin and another kind of man who's only got one slave owner He's, God is basically telling us in the Quran that you've got w one example of one individual who's got multiple slave owners and another one with just one. He says, Are they the same? So here, the idea is, as Rousseau said, he's a liberal philosopher, he said that man is born free but everywhere in chains. This is the order because if you don't have that God to, to worship, then you're going to end up having to worship to everything else. And the whole part of the Shahada which you took, which is Ashhadu uh, Allah ilaha illallah, Ashhadu Muhammad mm -hmm. Rasulullah, the, 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 the true meaning of that, La ilaha illallah, is that there is no God worthy of worship except for one God. Yep. Which means that your, des your desires or the system or these people that want to control us, they are, the problem is they're not worthy of worship. The only one worthy of our sub subordination and submission is the creator of the heavens and the earth. There's no one else. I agree, and it's, 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 I, I completely agree, and I've agreed with this for the longest time. You know, I've never been to like a music concert, mm. and people ask me why, and I said, I just look at it and I feel embarrassed. I look at someone up on a stage <laughs> dancing around and I look at hundreds of thousands of peasants in the crowd <laughs> just yeah 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 I'm like uh, it's embarrassing I'm I feel cringe it's like secondhand embarrassment when I see these festivals and everyone's losing their mind or these music concerts I genuinely feel embarrassed for the people who go because to me that is a form of worship like yeah you can listen to the music at home for free you like you don't have to wait in that line and stand out in the cold like I I don't know perhaps it was a bit extreme but I've always known that they're trying to give us false idols to some degree. And when I speak to atheists, atheists, they go, oh, I don't believe in God. But they, they've signed up so hard to the liberal woke agenda. They're yeah. as religious as anybody, but they're just believing in the wrong things. They're believing in degeneracy and they're believing in the work of the devil. So humans always need something to believe in. And it's a great thing you said about your own desires. It's like it's one, one guy I was talking to since my conversion says, it's interesting that somebody with everything, all the Western world, yeah, everything, yeah. everything somebody w could want exactly. has now converted. And I said, yeah, because even before my conversion, I understood that hedonism is a black hole mm. and you can never fill it. Mm -hmm. You're never going to be able to have enough girls to be happy with girls. You're never going to be able to have enough money to be happy with money. You're never yeah, going to yeah. be, be able to, you know, drink enough to be happy with drinking. Like it's a black hole and you can pour endless things down it, but you'll never fill it up. And you need to have some degree of self-restraint. And I've always been a very disciplined person. I've never made mistakes, but certainly, yeah, the higher power is, is, is going to give you more satisfaction in your heart than endless, I, endless insanity. Absolutely. Because I did see a clip of you um, ma making the same points. You were saying that, you know, I've done all of these things. Because the accusation is, well, you are the poster child of hedonism, right? Let's say this guy, what, this, you're talking about which, which, before, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah. But th what's annoying about that is I'm absolutely not. That's, yeah. what's, that's what's so annoying about that. Yeah, because yeah. I know so many people of my net worth. I will sit here and say, on the podcast before everybody and, and before God, voila, voila. <laughs> yeah. never, never slept with a prostitute or paid for sex in my life. I don't gamble. I've never taken a drug in my life, never tried steroids, never tried weed, never tried cocaine ever sure in my life, that, yeah. ever. <laughs> never, never, never. Yeah. Like... I drank a bit of alcohol, uh -huh. 
Okay. Smoked some shisha, smoked some cigars, and spent most of my life as an athlete, yeah. working hard, 12, 14-hour days, making money. But I look like, after my family. But, so for me to be, but yeah, it, yeah. they go, you're the poster boy of hedonism. I say, yeah. I know so many people who do so much worse than yeah, yeah, me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I really don't do that much. But I'm Andrew, not gambling. Andrew, from our perspective, if you've done all of that, your, your, your slate is clean. Which is, which is amazing. But it's just, in, it's just incredible to me that, especially at my level of net worth, right? I, I, I grew up in Luton, poor on a council estate, yeah, and, yeah. That, and now I'm pretty financially successful. And once yeah. you get past this, this line and you meet these other people who are, who are, as, who are as rich as I am, yeah. yeah, they go, they get a boat, they put 100 girls on it who are paid for, you know, a big pile of cocaine. That I, I don't do any of them things. Like mm-hmm. I, I would, I'd stand by and say I'm one of the ni- – for a man with a bunch of money from a council estate, I'm, I'm as pretty behaved as you can possibly hope yeah. for. So – no, I, I feel that in you. Obviously, you, you were, in your previous life, you, you were the champion, world champion in kickboxing. That, yeah. that requires a certain level of restriction, discipline, and these kinds of things. I, I do think that this is kind of like a misconception. Yeah. I mean, people think that you're, it's part of your marketing. It's probably uh, self-induced marketing. It's part of your marketing engineering strategy that you, you've, you've engineered yourself as, you know, this is, this is my life. But in reality, though, is it fair for me to say that if something doesn't have proper meaning and purpose for you, you won't really enjoy it. Yeah, I think a lot of people, in fact, the number one thing I hear from people who meet me in person is, I've had so many people meet me and they're like, you surprised me. I'm like, why? They're like, you just, you're just working, you just sit on your phone or you just work on your laptop and, you know, like they thought I'd be this crazy guy running around being crazy and they realize I'm extremely restrained. Yeah. I, I, I'm very careful about everything I do. From what's, the food. what's your routine like? Okay, so it's a good question. So yeah. I wake up, whatever time that happens to be. I don't, I, what time, what time do you wake up? I have a problem sleeping. Okay. I'm not good at sleeping. I really struggle with it. So I I can maybe get five to six hours a night, maybe. And the reason I can't sleep is because if my brain is even semi-conscious, I'm thinking of a work or some problem I have to fix. And then I end up on my phone and then I can't sleep. That's how it works. So Mm. I can give perfect examples. Like there's even, even before this podcast, I knew I had to be up I had to go doctors at eight and then I had to come to this podcast. So I said last night, let me try and go to bed a little bit early. I tried to go to bed at 11 and then I woke up to go toilet at 2.25 a.m. And then I was thinking about some construction in my house in Romania and some invoices that I hadn't seen yet. And then mm-hmm. by the time I messaged my assistant, that now I'm awake. Yeah. So now I've been awake since two. Like they, mm-hmm. I just, I can't turn my brain off. I struggle with it, right? Yeah. So I'm not good at sleeping, but let's say I wake up around nine-ish, okay. but I go to bed usually around three, four. Yeah. Uh, first thing I do is drink two liters of water. Then I train every day. I train for about what thir- do you do? I train for about thirty to forty-five minutes a day. I don't and train. What what is it? What kind of training is it? It depends where I am because I travel so much. Right, right. So if I'm in the if I'm in hotels, you kind of got to do what you can do, right? Okay. So mainly it's weights now. Um, mm. I, I don't box as often because it's it's inconvenient. Like if I was training for a fight, it's different. Yeah. And I was sparring a couple of days ago. I still got the move. No one can hit me, so I still got it. Yeah. But um, yeah, so usually about 45 minutes, I, 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 I tear through a bunch of weights. I just mm. go as crazy as I can, get that out of the way. Yeah. Bunch of coffee. I'm a coffee addict, I guess. I don't know if that's still allowed. I hope so. Yeah, but um, okay, good. Because uh, I love caffeine. I believe caffeine's a miracle drug. So I'll have two or three coffees, another two liters of water. I only eat dinner every day. I don't eat breakfast. I don't eat lunch. Yeah. And then from there, it's just completing tasks. I have something to do. I have a podcast with you to do, yeah. or I have somewhere to go, yeah. or I have to go. Maybe sometimes it'll be something good, like pick up a new car or new watch. Mm-hmm. But if not, I, t- I promise you now, I spend every waking second on my laptop or staring at my phone running the empire. That's all I do is work. Mm-hmm. Life to me is work. Life to me is work at the point now, sleeping's work. I only sleep because if I don't sleep, I wouldn't be able to work. Wow. If I could work without sleeping, I wouldn't sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, people look at my life and they, especially you're right with the marketing, they see the cars, they see the boats, they see girls, etc., And they're like, oh, wow, he's living this crazy life. And then they get around me and realize that, yeah, we're on a boat. Yeah, there's hot girls. Yeah, it's a yacht. But I'm on my laptop and I'm working. That, that's it. That's all I want to do is run the empire because it gives me, it gives me a sense of purpose. So mm-hmm. it sounds boring to say, but all I do is work, my friend. That's it. Wow. That's it. For, when I finish this... We'll talk, we'll have a bit of food, et cetera. I'll get in the car, I'll go back, and I will work until my next appointment. That's it. I just work. That's all I do. Mm -hmm. So it's, and it's kind of funny because people say to me, like, what's the secret to getting rich? And I'm like, it's easy if you, if you don't do anything else but work. Like, I don't have any, my only, like, I'm trying to think of what even even hobby I have. I love to drive. What is the secret of getting rich? 
That's a good question. <laughs> That's a good question. We, we live in an attention economy, yeah. so I think stage one is certainly attention. Mm. Stage two is once you have that attention, establishing credibility. Yeah. And then stage three, once you've established a credibility, is finding a way to genuinely improve people's lives. Mm. The reason I do so fantastically well is because everybody who's ever followed me or tried any of the things I talk about, yep. their life gets better. Yeah. So it's very easy to say, oh, I've tried Tate's program and my life's better. Or I tried this, I followed Tate and I feel happier. So then, yeah. of course, they're going to understand the brand and that's the way to do it. But but truly, it's it's hard work. You need to be able to work endless hours. It's extremely competitive. Mm. You need to be able to work as har harder than the other guys. And that's the only way I did it. I ground to the top the old-fashioned way, and that's still what I do. I just work. So with, with this, basically, I'll say that, you know, in terms of your routine, Islamically, the main thing to focus next on will be the prayers, yes. five prayers yep. a day, yep. right? And so that's obviously one in the morning, and then you, you'll have, like, prayer times and stuff like yep. that, where you have to do the ablution and learn to... You, I saw you kind of praying that was... Yes, the yeah, that was I'm, more, I'm learning it, and yeah, and I've been told the times, and I've got all this, and I'm, I'm going through all that, and I have to incorporate that as well. It gives you a solid structure. I feel like it gives you anchorage in the day. It's the spine of my personal day. I feel like, you know, it's... it's it just creates that structure in the day. Yep. And it's a spiritual thing. I mean, even the prayer itself, when one prays and they say Allahu Akbar, which is Allah is the greatest. Some yep. people think it's some kind of war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do it in war as well, I mean, to be fair. But they say Allahu Akbar, meaning Allah is greater than everything else, this whole world and everything in it. And then when they start engaging in prayer, then what you're doing is you're trying to, in a sense, get out of the zone of being in this world, connect with God, ask God for guidance. And we do that very consistently because... We feel like, I mean, the, the belief is that guidance is in God's hands, yep. you know, and so doing that, if, you know, spiritually cleansing, it's, for me, it's the most important thing that one can do in the whole day. So that